and welcome to The Vaccine. I'm Casey Briggs. This week our focus is on Victoria as Melbourne endures its fourth lockdown. Case numbers are stable in the state, just over five a day is the average at the moment and for the most part these cases are being tracked and traced back to known sources. There have been a small number of cases in the highest risk aged care sector but so far at least we're not seeing the virus take off in that setting. That is at least some comfort for a state that's currently going into the second consecutive week being locked down in a state that's deeply scarred already with two thirds of Australia's coronavirus cases to date and 90% of the country's deaths. Less comforting this week, the news of a second escape from Australia's containment measures. How exactly? We don't know. A family that's also been to Jervis Bay and parts of the New South Wales coast has a different strain of the virus to everyone else in the state. It's the Delta variant, first identified in India, and it's been designated a variant of concern by the WHO. It's more transmissible than the Alpha variant, first found in Kent, England, and there are concerns about reduced vaccine effectiveness against it. Delta is the predominant variant in India, and it's now also making up about three quarters of the United Kingdom's cases. Authorities there are worried it has the potential of derailing plans to lift lockdowns later this month. So authorities are trying to work out where this virus has come from. For the rest of us, it's another reminder to get vaccinated if we're eligible. The pace is climbing and we're clearing 100,000 doses a day at the moment across the country. And Victoria remains the single biggest factor in that growth. Some parts of the system are scaling up quicker than others. State-run clinics look to be speeding up faster than general practices. And the Victorian government says the problem for GPs is supply. We have made a request to the Commonwealth, um, a request to double uh, the uh, distribution, double the number of uh, AstraZeneca to our primary caregivers, the, our GP network. We agree with the AMA that our GPs can do double what they are doing. Norman Swan is the co-host of the Coronacast podcast. He joins us now. Good to see you, Norman. The Australian community, it's now had its expo another exposure to the newly badged Delta variant of coronavirus. Does that change anything about the way we need to combat this pandemic? Um, no, in terms of combating, it's, it's, the, it's contact tracing, it's testing, it's chasing it down, uh, making sure that anybody who's been in contact is in quarantine. So if they come positive, they are, you know, they're becoming positive in a safe environment, uh, both for them and for the community. It, it's, it's pretty basic. The worry here is, is just how much more contagious it is. So you, you refer to that in your intro. The Kappa, which is the 617.1, which is in Victoria, is probably somewhere between the British variant, the Alpha, and the Delta in terms of its contagiousness. It's certainly more contagious. But this one is another level of contagiousness again. So if the R0, the reproductive number, when you don't control it, for the Wuhan virus is maybe 2.4, um, the British, the British variant is maybe about four. That's not how many people you pass it on to. This one could be anywhere between six and eight. So it is very contagious. And, um, and increasingly, they're worried that it's vaccine resistant. What about um, vaccines when it comes to Delta, as you've just mentioned, the, the evidence points to the Pfizer vaccine being a little less effective. Is that going to cause us problems uh, with, you know, reaching herd immunity? There's mixed evidence on this, but they, it kind of points in the same direction. So there was effectiveness data that came out um, a couple of weeks ago comparing um, first and second doses of both Astra and Pfizer. And what that showed was dramatic reduction in the first dose effectiveness. So you, in the, with the original variant, you could rely on the first dose giving you pretty good coverage, not with this variant but pretty good coverage with the second dose. That's why it's so important to get the second dose in. But now another group has just published in The Lancet as we speak, which looked at the antibodies that are generated, which neutralize the virus. And it showed really quite significant reductions after the second dose of the neutralizing antibody, meaning it is um, the, these, the, that was to the Pfizer, by the way, and that, meaning that there is some vaccine resistance to this. And it points to later in the year, really us needing either boosters or variant vaccines, which cover the, 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 the vaccines, the variants then. The trouble is, the variants now are not necessarily going to be the variants at the end of the year. So it's, it's just going to be a bit of a race. And does it also mean, does it push the bar for herd immunity higher? Do we need more than 60 or 70 percent of people vaccinated? We really need 80 or 90 percent. Well, it, it, look, 
the two objectives with immunization. One is to turn COVID-19 into the common cold, so preventing severe disease. And it looks as though, we, although we don't have really solid data on that, but it looks as though from Scotland and elsewhere that um, it does it, it does prevent severe disease, but there's worrying data over the last 24 hours from Public Health Scotland of an uptick in hospitalizations, and there's an uptick in hospitalizations and deaths in, in England as well. So it, it may, you know, this variant may be quite a pernicious variant we've got to watch out for. But yet, yes, herd immunity and protection against severe disease, we've just got to get on to that. Back to the um, outbreak in, in Victoria at the moment. The Victorian government made uh, quite a bit this week of so-called fleeting transmission, contact through extremely casual transmission uh, of two people. Now, two of those cases have since been found to be false positives. Is there any evidence, Norman, that this virus is behaving in, in radically new ways to what we've seen before? Not radically new ways, but it, it, it does look... I mean, I think there are eight cases left. So the one in the Brighton Hotel was particularly worrying because it sounded as if it was outdoors. And there have been almost no outdoor spread globally. Um, I think there was one case in Germany, one situation in Germany, maybe a rock concert, I can't remember, and I think one in uh, the United States. So it's vanishingly rare, and it turns out this didn't happen in the Brighton Hotel, which is great news. But there have been other rather glancing contacts. That has happened elsewhere, but um, as these viruses become more contagious, it is going to become more common. So it's not a radical change, it's a gear shift. Norman Swan, thank you so much for your insights. Always a pleasure. Well, obviously, this uh, lockdown in Victoria is taking a toll on everyone. For more on that economic and psychological impact of this fourth lockdown, we're joined uh, from Melbourne by the president of the Melbourne Business Network, Wendy Dawson, and psychologist Monique Tuig. Uh, thank you both for joining us. I might start with you, uh, Monique. Anecdotally, I'm hearing from people in Melbourne that there's you know, a much shorter fuse, I guess, from people this time. The, the lockdown last year was one thing. This is a whole another thing. Are people just over this? Is it is it fair for people to just be sick of this? Absolutely. When there's uncertainty, it creates anxiety. When we can't, you know, it's I guess that's one of the reasons why concrete information is just so important. So in terms of, you know, okay, well, if we have to go into lockdown, how long? Um, and, and giving people answers as quickly as possible to, you know, I guess, reduce people's anxiety and also help people to transition into planning mode. Okay, well, what do I do to cope and survive um, and protect my mental health over the next seven and albeit 14 days? Yeah, I think what we've seen is this this um, a, a trend in people who are otherwise really mentally healthy experiencing some minor, um, I guess, challenges to their mental health in terms of being irritable or frustration or insomnia, and and sort of this um, an overwhelm and a fatigue as well that necessarily can't be explained by daily challenges. Victorians and, and Melbournians have been through a lot more here than um, others. Do you think there's likely to be a longer term scarring from these lockdowns uh, that that people outside of Victoria don't understand? Yes. Um, and, and also uh, a resilience too. So if we start with um, a degree of, I guess, extra stress, yes, indeed, this lockdown for some people um, in our community would have would have been quite triggering. It would have triggered memories of last year in particular in the very lengthy lockdown that we experienced, but also of the loss that some families experienced in losing loved ones from, from the virus and or experiencing it themselves and still being in recovery mode. And also being in recovery mode in terms of getting you know, making 2021 um, a year where they feel productive and things are getting back on track. And, and I think that that's been the challenge of this current lockdown is people feel like, OK, everything's been put on pause again and, and some anxiety about what's going to happen next and, and really some hopefulness that it's going to be very um, a short lived lockdown and we get back to normal. Yeah, perhaps the expectations that, that vaccines would, you know, end the need for these kinds of lockdowns. Practically, what can people do to sort of look after themselves in, in what is, again, another very difficult time for people? Yeah, look, I think one of the biggest things is accessing and using online platforms to connect with people and or making sure you're in contact with your, your neighbours and your family members. And also where possible, and, and of course, we've, you know, many parents have been seconded into homeschooling again. And so that, that beloved little, you know, um, I guess, few minutes of alone time. So finding little places in time to have some alone time. Um, whether that's, you know, going for your walk um, and really making sure that you're exercising a tool, a tool belt of healthy coping mechanisms to, to make this as easy as possible on, on your mental health, but also on your family's mental health as well.
Wendy Dawson, I might bring you in at this point because businesses have obviously been affected greatly by these lockdowns as well. Probably had hoped that we wouldn't be in this position again. How has the small business community taken this? Yeah, um, it's hard. It's really hard. And so much of what Monique was just talking about does resonate with us. Um, just yesterday, I hosted a webinar and it was a very impromptu thing. I put it out to members because what I wanted to do was just open up the communication channels and have people come on and just talk. If they needed a vent, they needed to, you know, if they needed any assistance, anything that the network could do because we are a not-for-profit and we're all about helping businesses grow and thrive together. And since this pandemic started, We've actually been trying to help businesses map a journey beyond fear, because I think that Monique would certainly agree that fear has been quite paralyzing for, for many businesses. And if I think about our members who are significantly um, small businesses, startups, we do have a couple of ASX listed, but we do tend to be on the smaller side. And to be a great startup or entrepreneur, you need to be optimistic. And so my members are probably some of the most optimistic business people in Melbourne, and they are finding it tough. How do you maintain that optimism when really there's not a lot of, of good news coming out? And the people that made it onto the call yesterday were different organizations, different sizes, different business industries, different target markets. And there was overwhelming consensus on frustration with the government, um, uh, mental fatigue. So going back to what uh, Monique was talking about with resilience, um, that's that's waning amongst those people. There's even just a little bit of the the tiresome of or being tired of some of the fear mongering that's going on out there in terms of, you know, just give us the facts we can deal with. We don't need the 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 virus to be um, characterized as a beast. Speak to us normally let us know what's going on because it's you know gosh so much of what Monique was saying you know I should have had her on the call yesterday with my members. Is there, has there have you detected a change in the views of small businesses from the long lockdown last year to this one that we're experiencing now? Yes is the short answer and it's it's not great it goes back to um, uh, yeah, some businesses have absolutely been hit hard or decimated or no longer in business. But even some of the businesses that have been going well during all of this, still at times, those business owners are finding the, the, the mental drain of being in a lockdown again, the uncertainty that Monique referenced. It is, it is, it's hard to kind of keep going in, in these situations. And these are businesses that from a PL point of view are great, but mentally businesses or business leaders are fatigued. Monique, have you got for the small business owners that are um, watching this, that are going through exactly what Wendy's describing there, what, what, what could they do to sort of, you know, build that resilience to just get through it, what is, you know, a day by day proposition? Mm -hmm. It's really to, to bear, bear down and access those internal resources to keep pivoting because I think 2020, you know, the word pivot for businesses was really a crucial one that aided their resilience and their ability to adapt to this new environment. And this year is really no different. In fact, the challenges may well be compounded and or different with less resources and less energy to do it. So I often say to my clients, well, you know, when we can't change a situation that is a little bit bigger than us, we can only try to cope with it in the best way that we can, but also invest fundamentally in your emotional well-being. And that can be going for a walk and becoming mentally fitter, or it could be actually just slowing down and, and using this time for rest in order to then have the energy to keep going for the rest of the year, because we also don't know what the rest of the year holds for us. Yeah. And to be hopeful and to have, you know, to really intentionally and deliberately cultivate thoughts of hope that this will not last forever. It will have an end point and to focus on what the next steps are for, for themselves as individuals, for their families and for their businesses. Monique Tui, Wendy Dawson, thank you so much for your time and, and both of you take care as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. And if you need more information or support, you can contact Beyond Blue on 1300 226 that's all for the program for now. Please join us again next time. Bye for now.